All right, good evening. Uh, this is United Medical ACO Diabetes Program Wednesday Wellness Webinar. Uh, my name is Kamal Erkan. I'm the chairman of the group. Uh, we have another uh, great session coming up. I have uh, Dr. Ripu Handal with us today and uh, our program uh, directors, uh, Amy Wilkinson and Donna Blanco, they're also with me. And I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves first and then we'll start the session. Okay, hi, my name is Donna Gunkel. I'm the Director of Clinical Integration. I'm here at United Medical ACO. Dr. Handel, you wanna go next? Uh, you can go ahead. Oh, I'm Amy Wilcoxon, I'm a dietitian and certified diabetes educator with United Medical ACO. And uh, I'm Ripo Handel, endocrinologist at First State Endocrinology and part of the United Medical ACO. Thank you. Um, and we also have uh, part of our team, uh, our physical therapist, who was our guest last month, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Tim McCrew. Um, and our social workers are also part of the program. Um, and we are trying to do this once a month with this uh, setting. And then once uh, also we have a support group, um, second and the fourth Wednesday of each month. Uh, second Wednesday is a regular lecture and the fourth uh, Wednesday is a support group. So uh, we, this is available for our patients. So, um, our panelists for today is gonna to be between Dr. Handal and uh, Amy. Um, and then we are gonna discuss the uh, hypo, uh, hypoglycemia uh, causes and treatments. And Dr. Handal is gonna start with, um, with the lecture. So Dr. Handel, we hear people with diabetes asking about, talking about low blood sugar, their blood sugar is gonna drop. How do we define hypoglycemia? And what are the symptoms that people typically have? Uh, that, that's a very good question. I mean, a lot of times people think hypoglycemia in their own relative terms. Like some people who has been running in 200, 300 range, their blood sugar drops to 100, 120s range, and they will define that as low blood sugar. And that's all they will usually say, oh, I took my insulin, my blood sugar dropped. And uh, then we will ask them, okay, what was your blood sugar? Oh, it was around 120, 130. So technically that's not low blood sugar. That's just relative low blood sugar as per that patient standard because they are just used to such a high blood sugar readings. So if you look at the criteria of hypoglycemia, which is low blood sugar as per American Diabetes Association guidelines. So the low blood sugar, the, the different levels, level one, level two, level three, Level one is defined as blood sugar below 70 milligram per deciliter and above 54 milligram per deciliter. So typically at this time, uh, at this level, patients may have different type of symptoms, some of which are shown on these slides. These are mostly neurogenic, means it will be stimulates uh, like uh, the nervous system is involved and causing these type of symptoms like sweating, feeling warm, hungry, tingling sensation in your hands, extremities, feeling shaky or feeling having tremors, heart racing, and just like little feeling more anxious, urgency, feeling nervous. So these are the earliest signs. So these are good signs to have because that warns you that, okay, your blood sugars are running low, better take action now rather than when there is more severe reaction. So next one is level two which is defined as blood sugar below 54. At this time now, more severe symptoms sets in. So people may have now difficulty thinking, they may get started getting confused, difficulty speaking, I can't see clearly, feeling faint, dizzy, feeling very tired, weak. Uh, they may also have motor dysfunction. I mean, they may not be able to hold a cup or like it's, they are asked to do certain things, they won't be able to do it. And ultimately, they may lose their consciousness and even have seizures. And the third level is defined as more severe hypoglycemia, level three. 
In this one, there is no specific plasma glucose threshold. Any person who presents with altered mental or physical status, who requires it, assistance from someone else for the treatment of low blood sugar. So that person will fit into this criteria. So this person can have different type of symptoms as outlined above. And in addition, may have a seizures too, and ultimately if not taken care of, this can lead to death. So these are the different clinical guidelines as per clinical guidelines, different levels of hypoglycemia. But as I explained earlier, some people may experience these symptoms even at a higher glucose level if their body is used to staying high all the time. Like for example, 200, 300 range, you immediately bring their blood sugars to 120s, 130, they may start experiencing the level one symptoms. So slowly we have to get used to their body to a relatively lower blood sugars, then they will start getting better. Um, thank you. Dr. Hundo, what is the reason for low blood sugar? Why does it happen in the first place? Well, there can be multiple reasons, but uh, let's talk about the, this normal physiology, what happens. Uh, there are two important hormones um, in the blood. One is the insulin, which is released by the islet cells. These are beta cells in the pancreas. Insulin is released in response to blood glucose levels. So once we eat, our blood sugar goes up that stimulates the release of the insulin. And insulin then indirectly helps to push the blood sugar down by pushing the glucose and also proteins like the amino acids into the cells. So main function of the insulin is to lower the plasma glucose. Now the other hormone is called glucagon. So that is works opposite the insulin levels. It is also released by the pancreas, but they're released by different type of cells called the alpha cells. And this works in response to low blood sugar levels. So when the blood sugar is low, the glucagon level hormone will stu get stimulated. And this works the opposite to what insulin does. It will promote the release of the glucose and the stored in the liver or in the muscles and the fatty acids from the liver into back into the bloodstream to raise the plasma glucose levels. So these are two important hormones which play a very important role in tightly regulating the blood sugars. Next slide. So what happens in people with diabetes? There are multiple defects. There is failure of the beta cells to secrete sufficient amount of insulin. The insulin, whatever is floating around, there is more insulin resistance. So it doesn't work well in the insulin sensitive areas. And there is a reduced storage of glucose in the liver in form of glycogen. So these are like uh, storage areas in the body where during daytime when we're eating surplus food, the glucose, whatever is utilized for the energy, the rest is stored in form of glycogen in the muscles, in the liver. So it can be broken down later on to supply glucose at the time when we are not eating. So when there, there is insulin resistance, then there, there may be a reduced glycogen formation in the liver which cannot be utilized later on to improve the blood sugars. And then the alpha cells also are not working properly. Instead of like the, when the glucagon levels should go down, when the insulin levels are going up, that doesn't happen. So the glucagon levels also stays consistently high. And over time, the cells, they, they, there is a loss of sensitivity to the glucose stimulus by the alpha cells. So that also won't work that properly to increase the blood sugars when it's really needed. Next slide. So there are numerous risk factors for low blood sugar. Um, in non-diabetic, like non-specific factors like ethnic groups, black race, then Hispanic eth ethnicity, age, as we age, there's more risk. Cognitive decline, people are not paying attention to their food. Low education, they don't, uh, understand the disease process, the medication, low household income, uh, not eating proper foods, lack of health insurance. Then chronic kidney disease is a major player. Uh, the, the kidneys clear the insulin. If the kidneys are damaged, insulin lingers on in the body for a longer period of time. 
than current smokers. That also worsens the insulin resistance. Alcohol use, when people are drinking too much, that shuts down the liver. So liver is not able to cope with low blood sugar by stimulating more in glucose release. And then stress can also play a role. Then in patients with diabetes, which is specific, the factors which are specific to diabetes is long duration of diabetes. They lack insulin, the glucagon is not working. When we try to aggressively control the blood sugar glucose levels, more risk for low blood sugars. With long history, there is a deficient insulin secretion, loss of glucagon response to hypoglycemia. Then with time, there can be autonomic failure where patient does not have the typical symptoms to detect hypoglycemia. So they are unaware of their hypoglycemia that is called impaired awareness of hypoglycemia. So that puts them at a higher risk for low blood sugars. And whenever there is a recurrent low blood sugars, that can also mount to more episodes of hypoglycemia. And then any bout of exercise, certain bout of exercise will make them more insulin sensitive and risk for hypoglycemia. Then any insulin therapy, especially insulin, other medication like sulfonylureas, they can increase the risk of low blood sugars. So there are multiple factors which play a role. So as a patient, um, they need to talk to their providers and see which of these factors may be playing a role and how they can reduce their risk of having low blood sugars. So oh, how common is hypoglycemia? Does it happen as often in people with type 1 diabetes as it does with type 2 diabetes? Well, uh, as you know, type 1 diabetes is insulin deficient. So almost 100% of type 1 patients are on insulin. And as I explained earlier, insulin is a risk factor for low blood sugars. So if you look on this slide, there are 1.6 million Americans with type 1 diabetes all require insulin. 100% of them are at risk for developing hypoglycemia at one time or another. When we look at the type 2 patients, they are insulin resistant. Not everyone is on insulin. So here in this slide, you see 16%, which is 5.2 million, they are on insulin. And then there are another 8.1 million people with diabetes who are on sulfonylureas type of drugs, like these are typical glybride, glipizide, glimepride. These are the more commonly used drugs. So these are another um, set of people who are at risk for developing hypoglycemia. So combining all these things, they're roughly around 15 million Americans on insulin or on sulfonylurea containing regimen, which puts them at higher risk for low blood sugars. So, um, Dr. Handel, I have one question related to this one. Um, with the type 2 diabetes, um, these are the ones already diagnosed after they have their test, but there are a lot of people who are not diagnosed because they didn't have their uh, proper blood work done, right? Right. So these are diagnosed people who are on medication. We're talking about those individuals. Yeah, because, they, you know, when we are going through our case conferences with now with the uh, Accountable Care Organization, and with the bariatrics, so what we see is uh, we are seeing a lot of people who are just first time finding out that they have actually uh, diabetes um, because they haven't done any blood work prior. Right. Right. Um, now, these are undiagnosed diabetes and a lot of people mm -hmm. still don't know. So the overall looking at the hypoglycemia in type 1 patients, they are at threefold higher risk, like type 1 pediatric as well as adult patients. They have a threefold higher risk of having severe hypoglycemia. Um, if you look at the pediatric incidence, there's an average of like two episodes per week. In the adult population, uh, based on the data indicates that like 30 to 40 percent of them may experience severe hypoglycemia and average the usual is one to three episodes of major hypoglycemia per year. Looking at the type two patients, 21% uh, of the patients on while on insulin will experience severe hypoglycemia and usual episode, one major episode per year. 50% uh, of them will be usually mild to moderate episodes with 23 events per person a year. So it, these type of episodes can be very common, especially in people as I explained, the risk factors, people are not 
well versed with their diabetes, missing their meals, taking insulin at the wrong times, taking their medication and not paying attention to their food. Uh, so multiple factors can play a role, which can increase their risk of hypoglycemia even more than what is shown on this slide. So Dr. Hundle, can you um, tell us why we or patients need to worry about hypoglycemic episodes? Yeah, hypoglycemia definitely should not be taken uh, like very lightly. Uh, some people, even as a provider also, we are negligent in terms of asking our patients, like how often you had low blood sugar, how often you had to get assistance from someone else. So hypoglycemia causes more, a lot of stress on the body, especially the heart. So as shown on your left-hand side of this slide, one out of 10 deaths of people with type 1 diabetes is caused by hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia can induce irregular heart rhythms and people will die while in bed, while sleeping. So the death in bed syndrome accounts for up to 6% of deaths in patients with type 1 diabetes who are less than 40 years of age. And as we age, then the risk for heart disease is even more. And that can cause cardiac arrhythmias with severe hypoglycemia. So we should not take this lightly. If somebody, patients are having these symptoms, we should take action to um, decrease their risk. And if from the patient point of view, if they are experiencing more hypoglycemia, they should immediately talk to their providers so how their medication can be adjusted. And then also with low blood sugar, as I explained, depending on the, their symptoms, there's a risk of falls, fourfold higher risk. And by falling, people can have subarachnoid hemorrhage, brain bleed, they are on blood thinners. A lot of older individuals can break a bone, osteoporosis, they have undiagnosed osteoporosis, hip fractures. After hip fractures, not too many people live that long. So this is not a simple thing. So people, I mean, they may end up in a wheelchair. After that fall, there may be a head trauma. So we all, patient as well as the providers need to take this seriously. And in addition to this, I mean, the, the hypoglycemia a, has been shown to be indirectly related to a lot of healthcare costs, direct as well as indirect. So looking at the direct cost, like 31% of the patients experience severe hypoglycemia, which has led to hospitalization. One visit to the hospital can be roughly around three to 5,000 uh, cost in terms of dollars. So that can be easily avoided. Just imagine one person going to hospital three, four times a year. That would be close to like 15 to 20,000 healthcare cost, which can be avoided by better taking care of the symptoms, taking care of the medications and education of the patient, how to avoid these uh, hospitalization. And then people who have one-time hospitalization, studies have shown that 32% of them will be hospitalized again. So even if it happens one time, first visit, we should immediately take action at that time to prevent another hospitalization. And then 40%, I mean, this is in the type two, this is in the type two patients, the 40% of the patients after experiencing, they will end up in the hospitalization. For type two, they are more older individuals as compared to type one. So their health cost is much higher as compared to type one person. Most of the time, the other comorbidities may play a role. Suddenly the blood pressure is low. They develop some EKG changes. So then more workup is on the way. So their cost is much higher than as compared to type one patients. And then 40 to 50% of them will be hospitalized again for uh, the severe hypoglycemia. So in addition to this, then there is indirect cost, which is 15 per fold higher in person with severe hypoglycemia, staying away from work. Then patients then start getting more uh, psychological effects, take away anxiety, depression plays a role, higher healthcare utilization, taking off from their work. So this is the, the cost is tremendous if you start looking at the hypoglycemia. So we should definitely pay more serious attention to 
this problem and try to take care of it in the most efficient way. And in this slide is just, I mean, the same thing which I discussed, it's just one episode that just leads to recurrent hypoglycemia that can increase their overall morbidity and mortality. Cardiovascular disease risk and mortality is increased. In younger individuals, recurrent hypoglycemia may lead to some CNS development changes. There is some controversy, it's not definite, may lead to cognitive decline. Even in elderly population with multiple episodes of hypoglycemia, they are not able to perform their daily routine. They are getting more confused, can't take care of themselves. And then the, uh, uh, this, the uh, intra, the hemorrhage that is higher in, in the individuals with the, uh, with the falls that can increase the risk. So these all type of things, it just perpetuates the whole cycle that we have to stop this cycle and prevent hypoglycemic episode. This is just not for acute, but chronic management of the disease. Um, can something be done to lower the risk of hypoglycemia? Well, again, there are different things to look for. Again, I alluded to some of them earlier. So if somebody's having persistent hypoglycemia, first to look into the reason why it's happening. If it's because of their dietary uh, habits, they're missing their meals, not eating at proper times, not taking the insulin at the right times. So a dietitian visit will be very helpful. Uh, the other day I had a patient with hypoglycemia and she was just eating more proteins rather than sugar. Um, well, I mean, Brad, I, this is like talking about sphere hypoglycemia. So eating, somebody told her, okay, you can eat bread with turkey and other things. So I had to explain to her, no, you need a, like a glucose, like plain glucose to quickly raise your blood sugars. But she was keep on here. She was shaking, trembling, all the things, but she wasn't eating the right type of food. So with that, if you eat a normal type of sandwich, it would take a while for the blood sugar to go up. Here we need an acute rise of blood sugars. So you are from the unsafe blood sugar, you come into a safe limit where you decrease your risk of harm to yourself. So in these individuals, we individualize their glucose targets, raise their blood sugars, okay, rather than keeping it around 100, let's keep it around 150s for next couple of weeks until things get better. Proper education, eating bedtime snacks, exercise is a very strong stimulus for lowering the blood sugars. People who do exercise, we tell them to take less insulin before their exercise. And even the effect of the exercise on muscle sensitivity can last for 12 to 18 hours. So for the next day, if there's suddenly one person today, relatives come and say, okay, let's go to the mall. Typically that person never walks. And on this day, he's walking around the mall for half an hour. That is an unusual exercise for him. Then he goes home, takes his usual dose of insulin at bedtime. Guess what? What's going to happen? In the middle of the night, is going to have a severe hypoglycemic episode. So these type of education is important. Glucose monitoring. If they can afford glucose sensor, that's the best way. But at least frequent monitoring of the blood sugar, uh, that's important. And then again, availability of the uh, glucagon injections, teaching their family members to give glucagon to prevent severe hypoglycemia and prevent transfer to the hospital. And then there, the, uh, on the other side, the right-hand side I already alluded to is that you understand like what, what really happened, why the person had low blood sugar. That will, if you correct that problem, maybe next time you won't have it. A lot of times people assume a lot of alcohol. Uh, earlier I mentioned that alcohol can inhibit the liver functions and can inhibit the liver from producing more glucose at the time of hypoglycemic episode. Uh, so these type of things have to be looked into individual patient, try to find the reason and try to correct it the first time it happens. But in some individuals, they have hypoglycemic unawareness. They don't get the typical symptoms. It's difficult in those indi individuals, but still in those individuals, we try to raise their blood sugar targets to much higher level and try to put them on glucose sensors, which are very good nowadays to detect early hypoglycemia and prevent severe hypoglycemic episode. 
So Dr. Hundle, can you talk to us a little bit about the current guidelines um, to treat hypoglo hypoglycemia? So again, guidelines are based on their uh, blood sugar levels. So as you look at this slide, there's a level one hypoglycemia where it is less than 70, but again, it's not, patient is still oriented, can take care of themselves. Uh, so in this one, most of them, they have the symptoms. They can tell their blood sugars are going low. So we usually tell them to keep glucose tablets, some snacks like a post-directing glucose, uh, which uh, they can talk to get well. Then they talk to their dietitian also. When you attend nutrition classes, they are taught about these things. So that is the first line treatment. They usually take 15 grams of sugar. And then uh, after 15 minutes, they can check their blood sugar again. If not, not coming. It all depends on what's the reason. If they took a very high dose of insulin and ate very little, that insulin effect is going to linger on for four to six hours. So during that time, they have to make sure they eat more and bring the, keep the blood sugars up. But again, important to recheck their blood sugar again after some time because they may bring their blood sugar up for the time being, but if they don't eat more than the effect of the insulin which they took, again, after some time, maybe 30 minutes, one hour, it can happen. So that's it. Level two hypoglycemia, where the blood sugar is less than 54, it depends on the symptoms. Um, sometimes they may be able to take care of them, but other times if they are more severe, if they are unconscious, then the family members have to take care. So as same thing as level three hypoglycemia, where it's severe, the patient needs assistance from someone else, then if most of the time, if the patient is not alert, then better not to put something in the mouth because they may go the wrong way into their uh, trachea and can choke them. So if the patient is not alert, then better not to put anything in the mouth. Then that's where the glucagon, other than obviously calling 911, you should have glucagon kit in your home and give them glucagon injection right away. That will improve their blood sugars. And in 15 minutes, they can repeat another glucagon injection. So that this is like an emergency treatment for severe hypoglycemia, where the patient is not totally out, unconscious, or have seizures, then definitely these are the things to do. Dr. Handel, we were losing you a little bit. Um, uh, all right. Good, good. Did you hear? It's okay. okay. Yep, it's, it's better. And uh, the, uh, with the carbs, as I was explaining about the example of another patient. So again, these are simple sugars, which I'm pretty sure Amy will, uh, can shed more light on. So these are very simple sugars. It needs quick absorption. So you don't want like something which are more complex carbohydrates that takes a longer time to digest in the food, liquid, sugar drinks. These are quickly, you want to raise the blood sugar. So you're not looking for like a more whole wheat bread sort of the things that can be taken later on. But to acutely improve the blood sugars is to have sugar things. So usually typically we tell them 15 grams of sugar, recheck the blood sugars and in 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, most of the time it should start coming up. And they can have another one if they if they still, it's not coming up as they still having symptoms. But again, try not to overdo. Or sometimes people eat so much the next time, then they after one hour, two hours, they check the blood sugar. Now it's 200, 300 on each. So overcorrection of hypoglycemia is also not good. Then later on, they keep on giving more insulin, then they're just trapped in that cycle of low and high blood sugars. And then the glucagon is mostly for level two and three hypoglycemia. Um, usually, the, any family members, any staff members where they work, uh, colleagues, friends, um, if somebody is having severe frequent hypoglycemia, then these uh, staff or the co-workers may also be need to be trained. Somebody needs to know, okay, how to administer glucagon, which is very, very simple nowadays with new uh, injections. It's anybody can administer glucagon. So that, that's very important to have for these type of individuals. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about what injections are available for patients with diabetes for glucagon in injections? Uh, yes. So glucagon is available by prescription. Um, they, they were uh, the first generation glucagon injections. They, they come in a, with a 
it's a powder form. You have to inject the solution, mix it, and then draw in the syringe and then inject. Uh, it can be given intramuscularly, subcutaneously, or even intravenously if that's in the hospital. So that the, these are the older forms. And then the new forms are, it can be given either intranasally, so just a spray. Uh, then it can be given by injection. Uh, which is subcutaneously. There are these are two different types of injection. One is called the GVOC, and the other one is, is the newer injection, that is the desiglucagon or Zealog. So these are the different type of medications available. It will depend upon the insurance, which one they cover. If they don't cover the second generation one, which are very easy to use, then at least have the first, the injection one uh, available at home. Uh, so it's given, most of the time it's given subcutaneously. Uh, the side effects can be nausea, vomiting, some headaches with the injection that the site of the injection can be some irritation uh, that usually goes away pretty quickly. Uh, with the nasal spray, there can be some uh, nose irritation uh, that can happen. Uh, these uh, can be stored for a long period of time. Uh, usually, as you see in the first generation, it can be stored at the room temperature. Uh, the second generation one also can be left on the room temperature. The last one, uh, the, uh, the ZLR can be kept up to one year at room temperature. So again, these are, because I mean, it's not, it's not happening in persons who will have a reaction one or twice a year. I mean, you don't need to keep thousands of them at home. Uh, but if somebody's having quite frequent hypoglycemic episodes, that they may need room injection setting. And if you can move to the next slide here, I just there are pictures of these ones. So on the left-hand side is the first generation where they have to be mixed and then injected. But the other ones, these are like, just like the, the first one is the Vaxemi, that is by nasal spray. Um, and the other one is the, as just like EpiPen. So just like nothing needs to be done, just you put it on the, on the belly or on the or thighs or on the arms and just press the button. So it's, it's very, very easy to administer. Anybody can do it. And in this slide is showing the, how the, after the injection of the glucagon and the Zealog, uh, how they quickly blood sugars, if you see within 10 minutes, 15 minutes, they jump up blood sugar by 44 to 60, by 30 minutes is up to 90 points. If somebody was way down in 50 uh, milligram per deciliter, within like 15 minutes, it will jump up to 90 to 100 milligrams per deciliter, which is in a safe zone. People usually will, will be up if they lost their consciousness. So these are very effective way of quickly reversing the level two and level three hypoglycemic symptoms. Thank you, Dr. Handel. So we're gonna move into uh, more on the, uh, the dietitian side. Um, so Amy, can you talk to us a little bit about what foods, uh, you would recommend that someone, um, eat when they have low blood sugar? I know Dr. Handel uh, was talking a little bit ago about, um, not having any complex carbs. Yes. So as Dr. Handel said, complex carbs, like whole wheat bread, um, things that we would normally want you to eat in a, in a healthy day when your blood sugar is good. Um, we don't want you to have here. So we want you to have simple sugar, um, food that does not have fiber, fat, or protein that is straight carbohydrate is digested the quickest. And that's what you want. So I hear all the time, and I'm sure Dr. Hundle does. Well, I had, I had chocolate and then I had a sandwich and I had a granola bar and it still didn't go up <laughs> um, because they had fat and they had fiber and they had protein. So I always tell them no chocolate. You want sugary candy, uh, a roll of Smarties, which you can get a pack of Smarties from the dollar store is six grams of carbs. So two and a half, two to some, for some people, two rolls is enough. Some people need three, um, four ounces of juice or soda. It should not be diet. Um, I've had people tell me they go in, they're having a low, I need a soda and somebody gives them a diet soda not going to help you. So you need a regular soda. As Dr. Hundle said, you don't need a lot. So some people feel so terrible that instead of having four ounces, which is very small, half a cup, they'll drink 20 ounces. And then their blood sugar is really high and it's hard to bring down. 
Um, eight ounces of milk. I don't like milk as much um, because it also has protein and it can have fat if it's whole milk, um, but it is something that you can use. It's liquid, so it is going to be digested faster. Um, hard candy, I usually say no Jolly Ranchers because they're too hard. They take too long to eat. Skittles, Smarties, Jelly Beans, like the picture. Kids, a lot of times that I work with who are not always um, agreeable to eating honey is really good because you can just sort of shoot it into their mouth as well as the glucose gel, which is kind of like honey. And then um, four glucose tablets because they're usually four grams of carb. So it's called the rule of 15 because you take 15 grams of fast acting carbs and then you wait 15 minutes. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So in 15 minutes, you want to repeat your testing. If it's still below 70, you want to have 15 grams again. Um, if you have, it was really, if you have a CGM that continues glucose monitoring and you see two arrows dropping, sometimes it's going to need more to bring it up if it's going down fast. Um, so you, you might have to do it again. And the same thing, 15 grams fast acting carbohydrate. One of the things that Dr. Hundle referenced, and I, I hear a lot of people missing, is they just go about their day. If, you, if your blood sugar is low because you still have a lot of insulin working, you're going to have another low. So if you're going to eat, go ahead and eat your meal. If you're going about your day, you see a spoonful of peanut butter there. So having a quick spoonful of peanut butter, having a handful of nuts, a piece of turkey, a piece of cheese, you need something with protein to help stabilize your blood sugar so it doesn't drop again. So a lot of times people think, well, peanut butter has sugar, it's gonna raise my blood sugar. Remember, you don't want that right away because peanut butter is mainly fat. So once it's up, you want something that is slow to digest. So it's going to keep things steady for a while. Um, a lot of time, people who struggle overnight, we will often recommend something like a little bit of carbohydrate, like crackers, whole wheat crackers with peanut butter to keep them steady overnight. So they don't, so they don't drop down. Um, so one of the things with, with low blood sugar, with doing that, um, Dr. Hundle, and I think you referenced this too with, with over-treating, with having too much, and then also referencing how people did not feel well when their blood sugar is, is low, but it's, it might only be 150, but they're used to having blood sugar in the 300, so they feel terrible at 150. Um, a lot of patients will tell me, well, I started eating candy because I felt low, but they didn't check. Um, and I do encourage people to eat. If your blood sugar is not actually low, eat something with protein because we, we want you to get used to that. If your blood sugar is not actually low, um, if you always are treating it, it's always going to be high. <laughs> So, and Dr. Hondo, you might have something to add to that to explain that a little bit better than I just did. It's just like it says, your body is used to very high blood sugars all the time. So when we initially start them on treatment, we also try to bring the blood sugars slowly down. Then slowly body gets used to it. Then you don't experience those symptoms. So as a provider and as a patient also, I mean, it's, it's all right to tell your providers that, okay, I'm having these symptoms. That is expected. But again, Try not to have a gene or I mean, knee jerk reaction. It's okay, I'm going to eat more without checking. Sometimes the palpitations, feeling hungry, maybe a normal sign, normal, like maybe you're a little dehydrated, heart racing. Don't attribute all of these things just to low blood sugars. Anxiety symptoms are the same symptoms as a hypoglycemic symptoms. Mm -hmm. So don't all the time. So that's why initially, when you're not sure, check your blood sugar. And then, yes, if it's low, take action. Again, don't assume all the symptoms are just because of low blood sugar. Because somebody, person, your friends around you, they have diabetes, they'll say, oh, yeah, well, this is low blood sugar. Eat some candy. You'll be fine. So, again, don't go that. Thank you. Any, any other questions, comments? I was going to say a comment. Um, so one of the things that I just want to remind um, our patients about is we do have a lot of videos out there. So just like this one, uh, we've been doing this for um, over a year and a half now. So we have uh, various topics out there on our YouTube channel. But Amy also does um, a series of quick tip videos. 
And one of them is around uh, treating low blood sugar. Um, so most of them um, are around three to six minutes. So they're very quick, uh, but they teach you these types of things. And I know in your video, Amy, you always talk about having that little kit. It can be just in a Ziploc bag, but having something with you so that if you're out shopping, um, as Dr. Hundle talked about, or you're doing some activity and your blood sugar goes down, you have, you know, this little emergency kit in your car, maybe have one in your home. So it's the proper amounts. And I didn't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about the little kit um, that you yes, recommend. So I, I have in my office, which I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have it with me now, a bag. It's just some soda, a little juice box and candy um, to have things with you. If you are a candy eater and you're going to be tempted to eat the candy when your blood sugar is not low, that's not probably not a good idea. It's probably better to have glucose tablets. If it's very hot, you might not want to keep a soda or juice in your car. So keeping something that works with you um, all the time. The other thing that I will, um, especially for older patients who may have some unexpected low blood sugars in the middle of the night, is to always keep something by your bed. Um, I'm sure Dr. Hundle has unfortunately patients who are falling out of bed or falling down the stairs with low blood sugar. So to have something that's right there because they don't want somebody to have to go really far if they wake up in the middle of the night with a low to have something um, right there to have that quick sugar. And the glucose tablets are very, they, they, they probably have an expiration date, but I think they're good for a long time. <laughs> so they're pretty easy and they come in just these little tubes. So always having something with you in your glove box, in your, with your meter, because ideally you're checking before you treat it, as Dr. <laughs> Hundle just said, um, in your pocket, in your purse, and not peanut butter crackers, but something with sugar. A glucose tablet is always good. You keep it in your pocket or in your purse. That's the best one, because usually you snacks and things. If you leave in the car for too long, now with the summer coming, it's inside of the car, it's like, boiling hot so yes. when you keep those snacks it's going to melt away everything <laughs> that's true that's a good you sound like if the ai got into you so like kind of static but i think we are you guys having the same issue are you guys able to hear him okay mm -hmm. is it just yeah, me it's maybe it's my connection here i don't know i'm in the office first time uh, for this event. So Dr. Kanda, what I was going to say, which what you mentioned already, we, one of the issues that we always see with these chronic illnesses, management of these chronic illnesses, is the prevention and the detection of these issues uh, in a timely manner. So our case conferences are trying to help our providers to uh, uh, help with the patient management. Uh, our uh, diabetes program is uh, outstanding with our uh, dietitians on board. Um, we are really doing this as a support uh, to our providers so from the primary care uh, standpoint. And we want more patients to take advantage of these, um, uh, uh, these services. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can reach out to more people. These are covered uh, services by the insurance. Uh, but what we know is... Um, if uh, there's a timely, uh, uh, pre like if the prevention happens in a timely manner, then a lot of uh, good outcome can happen uh, earlier because once it's too late, it's gonna be costlier, but it's gonna be also, more people are gonna be suffering from these uh, very simple, uh, like very um, easily uh, preventable issues, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just seeing it every day. Like today, we had patients, first time they find out that their A1C is 13, she's going to see you in a couple of days. Yesterday, we had a patient with A1C 12, and then they didn't, they never had a blood work done. And they're not like 20 years old, 25 years old, they are um, mid age. So the blood work uh, is part of the prevention, and people like, Patient, people should need to understand that you don't have to be sick to um, uh, get your uh, annual physical, which is going to provide you your blood work. And then hopefully we can help you to identify these issues early on and uh, help you um, in a timely manner. And I think you're right, um, Kamal. One of the things that we talk about in the, in the case conferences 
patients may have had, uh, you know, a disease like diabetes for a long period of time. And they're like, oh yeah, but it's always been that way. Or, you know, I don't worry about that. Or I get that, you know, blood work done every couple of years, but they have to remember that the, the progression of the disease, right. Happens over time. It doesn't happen overnight. So to your point, I may be feeling well, or that's just normal for me at some point, it's probably going to catch up with them and then they're not going to be feeling well and they may end up in the hospital or they have many other complications that we've talked about on our series here uh, with some of the other uh, specialists. So just pointing that out that yes, prevention, um, routine care. Um, I know you are very busy, Dr. Hundle, but we do have a lot of patients out there that don't come as frequently as they should and don't get their blood work. And we see it that the last time their A1C was checked right now, when we're doing our case conference was back in 2020 and it was 12 then. And we have no idea what it was in 2021 or what it is today. Absolutely. So Dr. Handel, I know you have another engagement at 7 p.m. You are a busy man. So thank you for being with us. So we'll be back on March 23rd with the support group. Uh, so the emails will go out for the, that's a private event. Uh, Amy and Donna will be there. Uh, well, thank you for um, watching us and please let us know if there's any way, any other way that we can help you. So uh, we'll see you next. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye -bye.